Well, Clark, if you want to start us off, we can use our unofficial sure. um, pre-start time since uh, we're going to go with Carl's yeah. time and start at 402 for real. <laughs> go ahead and just introduce the current exec team. Clark, you want to go ahead? Sure. Uh, my name is Clark Maddox. I'm the director of the Watauga Residential College at Appalachian State University. I've been on the executive team now for just one year, so this is the first year that I've been on. Um, and I am the uh, logistical facilitator of this meeting. Uh, uh, if you have never used Zoom, uh, there are various ways in which you can raise your hand. The easiest way is in the participant tab, and you'll see a way to raise your hand there. Um, but uh, we can also just have a have a, a lively conversation. Shannon, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, as soon as I can find the unmute button. Yeah, I'm Shannon Lundin. I'm the uh, Director of Academic Residential Partnerships um, and Associate Professor of Philosophy here at Elon University. Um, so we get whatever comes through the mountains through Clark passes through us over in Central North Carolina. Uh, we are um, uh, really excited to uh, hear what everybody else is doing at their uh, relative institutions. I've been uh, with RCS for how long have we been around for now? <laughs> 2016. How? Since when? 2016. Okay, thank you. So that's how long I've been. <laughs> <laughs> it's all such a blur with the pandemic. Uh, and um, I'm the co-chair of RCS along with uh, Jamie Penman. Jamie, are you with us now? If not, yes, Carl. I am. Okay. Jamie, you uh, want to we've actually grown to two screens. So I, I was like, does she not see me? I'm like, it's me right in her and Sarah than, than Shannon. <laughs> We're introducing ourselves, Jamie. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, so Jamie Penvin, uh, Assistant Vice President for Student Success and Retention at Radford University. Um, and also serve as co-chair alongside of Shannon for the, um, the Res College Society. And we have the host of this year's RCS, uh, the Residential College Symposium, Sarah. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Kelly. I serve as the Senior Assistant Principal for Preston Residential College at the University of South Carolina. And I'm also the webmaster for residentialcollegesociety.org. And you know, 2020 chair. <laughs> Over to you, Trish. Hi everyone, I'm Greg from St. Louis. I'm Trish Gomez, and I'm an assistant director here at WashU in St. Louis, and I'm one of the secretaries for RCS. So I'll, I'll take notes for this uh, meeting. Hi, my Carl, name is do Jennifer. you want to introduce yourself? Sure, I guess I'll go. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Carl Krieger. I serve as director of uh, residential education for student life at Purdue University. Uh, and I am a um, social media person with RCS, and I've been with RCS since the beginning. Uh, I, st I stepped on Jen. I apologize. Yes, yeah, Jen next. <laughs> No worries. I was just trying to keep it moving. My name is Jennifer Post. I'm the Director of Residence Life at Southern Methodist University. Um, and I've also been on the board since the very beginning. Rishi, to you. Uh, thanks, Jen. Uh, my name is Rishi Sriram, and I'm an Associate Professor of Higher Education at Baylor University. And we had the privilege of hosting the last Residential College Symposium in November with Everything was rosy and we were all happy about the world and the way things are headed. Uh, but it's really great to, to be with you all today. So I, we, have, we have some questions that I think will um, that can kick off a conversation here. Um, I'm going to I'm going to throw out a couple of questions and feel free to go ahead and introduce yourself and let us know. You can also, of course, use the chat function if you want to um, if you prefer to type something in. Um, so did you go ahead and hit record? You did, right, Clark? Yes, and I can share the screen that has at least some of these questions, so. Okay, great. Yeah, I think it's got pretty much all of them. So why don't we just start with the first uh, two. So what, 
what campuses do we know have already made decisions about 2021? And um, for those of you that are not sure, have you been given any kind of date as to what, uh, when you're gonna know things about fall 2020? And I'm gonna go ahead and add the third one and how is that impacting your residential colleges if you have them or your overall residential campus? And I don't think we have to be too formal. Just go ahead and pitch in to answer those if you'd like. And if it gets too chaotic, we can use the raise hand feature. Leslie Spielman. Hi, Leslie Spielman with Huntington College at the University of Oklahoma. Um, as of now, we are going to be open for on-campus classes in the fall. Um, and we are going to be having residents, but we haven't gotten details beyond that. That's the same story for, I'm Jennifer Stevens from UNC Greensboro. That's the same story for us. The UNC system has made the announcement that we will be face to face in the fall, um, but the campus is in the midst of making some decisions about what that will look like. We know there will be some limits on enrollments in the residence halls. Um, so how that will impact our enrollments in the residential colleges, we are yet unclear about. That's the same for Baylor University. Uh, we, we made the decision. I'm speculating here, but I imagine it had a lot to do with admissions and, uh, and wanting to give some sense of, uh, of commitment for students so that students can make a commitment to us. But I think there's this real sense of put it out there 90 days away and kind of hope for the best. So I don't really know what we're expecting to actually see or encounter in the fall, but we have gone public that, that that's our plan. I'm just curious to, I mean, I, I think I've heard a lot of uh, in this call and in kind of the public sphere uh, on the internet um, that basically people have said, we're going to open up and I've yet to hear anybody have any specifics whatsoever. Uh, is there anybody that uh, that's here that has any, spe that, that they're, their leadership has said anything about specifics when it comes to uh, your residential colleges and how you're going to have residents at all. I'm just curious. I, th I think I'll, I'll pitch in on that one, Carl. I, I think that's one of our complications right now, you know, is uh, uh, as others have already said from the UNC system, We've been told that we are going to open in the fall, but Roper is leaving so much up to the individual chancellors, it seems, that we kind of don't know how that's going to play out. Um, so we're told we're going to be here in the fall, but that's about it. And, uh, just beyond that, I mean, I know some schools, um, our colleague from Charlotte, I think, just said that, uh, you know, they'll start on 7 September. Uh, we haven't been told what date we'll start uh, or if we'll start on time. Uh, so there's still a lot of um, uh, uncertainty for us at this point. We are scenario planning um, both in a, on a broader scale at the university, but also within residence life and student housing. And so we are considering options that include full occupancy, single occupancy, um, which could include hotels to accommodate our obligations, um, delayed start. Um, if we do single occupancy, we're considering scenarios where our first year students live on campus uh, and our returning students live in hotels, we're considering vice versa, although I hate that option. Um, I don't love any of these options, but you know, it's where we're at. Um, and so some of the questioning that we're, that leads down to that, down that path then is how do we create any kind of community and engagement and sensitive identity if we have our students scattered all over campus and off campus? Um, and that's, and we can't do any of our large scale programming. We can't cram 60 people into a faculty and residence apartment. Um, so that's a lot of what we're starting to think about is, is how do we achieve our objectives as a residential college in, in a time of social distancing and pandemic? And I don't have answers to that.
Well, I'll just follow up with that to ask, um, you know, what kinds of things have people already planned for their smaller communities, whether they're learning communities or their residential colleges or particular uh, residence hall or apartment, let's say, what kind of implications do you have for both the staffing model in terms of both student staff as well as faculty and staff? And uh, what kinds of programming um, changes are you anticipating having to make, assuming that the CDC, um, as well as perhaps, depending on what state you live in, perhaps state uh, is going to be issuing guidelines about you know, social distancing, but then also not having gatherings over, say, 50 or even 10. So what kinds of plans have you all considered? I'm, I'm not going to imagine that you've actually put them into place yet, but what kinds of plans have you all considered? Uh, this is John Sopper. I'm at the University of North Carolina Greensboro, and um, I direct one of our three residential colleges. And some of the things that we're talking about, at least within um, within Grogan Colleges, we do have the advantage of we have some, and I suppose others probably do as well. Uh, you know, upper uh, division peer leaders um, who are part of our student leadership, and we're talking about ways that they can be connected virtually to small subgroups of populations within the residential college to provide some peer mentoring. Um, we started talking about ways that they can do um, sort of invite speakers or invite professionals from the local community um, for online virtual chats and engagements with small groups of students. Um, this is all very preliminary, but some of the things that, that we have um, are you know, student, student peers who can amplify the online interactions with students. Um, so that's some of the things that we've thought about ways we can bring some of our mentoring and some of our programming um, to students online. We also have talked about, we have two classrooms in our building. And so we've talked about ways that we can utilize them both simultaneously for a single class and divide the class into smaller groups if we're allowed to have um, students meet face to face at least in groups of 10. Um, we can still mount classes um, in two groups um, in two separate rooms that are connected through technology. Um, we've talked about um, also staggering uh, and for the courses that are part of the program. Um, I've got faculty thinking about ways that they can meet half the class one day, half the class the other day, um, maybe do a virtual meeting um, if it's a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class, those kinds of things. So we're just starting to think creatively about how to use space, how to use students, and how to reconfigure classes um, as hybrid, half on, half off. I think that uh, one of the things or several of the things that we're looking at, and we have been told by uh, our own administration to prepare contingencies for the fall, even if we're on campus, you know, how would we deal with uh, students who are at risk uh, or immunocompromised. Um, we are an academic residential college, so uh, students take about half of their general education, uh, much like Ashby and some of the other ones, uh, uh, but students take about half their general education classes with us. So it's difficult to limit the classroom. What we are doing is uh, preparing uh, an, an online section of our first year class uh, for students who just may not be able to come to campus. Uh, and again, I don't really prefer that in a residential college, but I think that's something uh, we're getting ready to do. Uh, and then we are planning to limit our lunch service in our own great hall where students share lunches on Tuesday and Thursday, uh, and then limit uh, social gatherings uh, is a contingency plan anyway to, to 50 students or less. We have a large community activity that we do every year. And at this point, we're kind of waiting. We're thinking about if we have to 
conduct that in spring of 2021 and use it as kind of capstone event rather than an introductory event for our student. Uh, so those are some of the initial things that we're looking at. We are doing uh, weekly meetings for our incoming class of 130 students, uh, and we're doing weekly virtual meetings for them uh, starting on May 15th. Uh, is there anything that any of you have found in this move, for, you know, for most of us that happened in March to going transitioning to being online and for most of us working remotely? Um, any techniques that you've developed or programming initiatives that you were able to successfully transition to an online environment that you would carry over into your planning for the fall, given um, that we're unsure of what what the limits are going to be on face to face inter interaction with our students? Hi there, uh, this is Ryan Hickox from Dartmouth College. I'm the uh, head of one of our residential houses. Um, and I think, at least for us, the um, the one thing that seems to have gone very smoothly in transition, pretty much the only thing, <laughs> but... My unmuted, okay, great, sorry. Um, is the... Uh, uh, our student leadership, each one of the houses has, as with many residential colleges, a student executive board. And uh, they've been meeting weekly on Zoom. They usually meet with me anyway. And we actually kept just around the same meeting time and are coming back to, to meet every week. And it's um, been remarkably successful. They've managed to keep, they've managed to keep some level of programming going. And I mean, we can, it sounds like we're gonna talk about some of those other details later. Um, but I think that more importantly, they've kind of kept their cohesion as a group and they've actually continued to see their own purpose as leading the, the community of students. Um, and so obviously we'd like to have them together in person. It's way better. But um, when we move into the fall, uh, I think Mike Wooten from Darwin mentioned uh, in the chat that we're probably only going to have about 30% of our, or maybe a little more, 40% of our students here uh, is that is a possible plan. Um, uh, the So obviously some students are going to be remote and I'm at least encouraged a little bit that we may be able to keep a student leadership model going that would include remote interaction that may be more successful than I would have originally thought. So anyway, that that's definitely going to have to be something that our thinking goes for. But, but sort of keeping that, keeping the kind of routine that we had been in seems to have been successful for them. And by the way, this is my first time calling into any of these. I just want to say thank you for, for organizing. This is really cool. Hey, we did we oh. did make a decision. I'm sorry. We did make a decision fairly early on to delay our student government elections. Normally, we would elect our executive team uh, for the student government in the spring. Uh, and we simply were not getting the, the students were overwhelmed and concerned with the remote learning that was suddenly uh, foisted on them. And so we made a decision really soon to, uh, to, to, to hold off on all of our elections for student government uh, until the fall. Hey, Matt from Virginia Tech. Um, so we kind of first realized that, you know, we want to get students together to kind of just process what was going on in this new world. And we found that that actually wasn't getting a lot of traction, um, that um, students really weren't participating unless there was a specific purpose. So maybe it was like an art workshop or something that like gave them a little bit of a distraction from the current situation. So I think that's like something that we are really have been paying attention to and I know a mentality that s several of our programs have been thinking about going into the fall is how can we really, um, I don't want to say simplify, but how can we kind of really give a clear message to students, this is what we're about, these key things, and, and try to make it very clear because especially if they're not going to be in person, um, you need to be able to provide that in a way that is not overwhelming, right? And as we all know, Zoom can be really overwhelming and it already is. Um, so we're just, I think we're thinking about our messaging and we're thinking about how much like quantity of what we're offering.
One of the, hi, that's Carl from Purdue. Um, one of the things that we've been talking a lot about, and I, I think that I would say I, I'm unsure whether or not it's positive or not yet. I don't think we have enough data. Um, but one of the things that we've done is we've backed off on talking about learning outcomes and focusing on learning outcomes and really just focused on uh, satisfaction and a, and interaction and that's it um, because we were hearing from students that they uh, they didn't want to um, they didn't want to learn like they they weren't wanting to learn outside of the what felt like this overwhelming uh, the cloud of learning that they were trying to navigate with their classes and they didn't need another side set of learning that was being uh, pushed on them. And so from the programmatic side, uh, we really kind of shifted our orientation from being learning outcomes focused to being program, outf program outcome focused. And when we did that, we were really looking at attendance um, and advertising and how we were getting people to be aware of what we were doing and whether or not they were then satisfied with what they were doing, um, which was a bit of uh, a, a uh, diversion from our traditional focus on what are the learning outcomes we want them to achieve at the end of a program. And so uh, we're still up in the air about whether or not that's working, um, but we are trying our best to assess it. I do have to say, I, one of the most successful things we've done this spring, and we will almost certainly continue it next year uh, when we welcome the class of 2021, uh, even if and assuming we are all kind of back together and back to normal on campus, uh, but we, we decided to have a Zoom meeting between uh, our current sophomore class and our incoming freshman class. And that was just fabulous. I think all of the first year students were there, uh, probably 70 to 80% of the sophomores that were there. And it was just a terrific time for them to get to know one another uh, and, and for the first year students to ask questions. Uh, in a very non-threatening way and um, the faculty who were present kind of didn't need to do anything. We just sat back and and let the conversation take place. To build on, um, I think it was Carl's point earlier about the sort of expectations and outcomes. One of the things that I've at, at Dartmouth that I think we've thought about a lot, our, our residential college system is four years old now. Um, and we've thought a lot throughout is the value of any kind of activities or programming that you do. Um, there, there's a lot of benefit to the students who attend it, but there's also, we have a, we have a system where the students are randomly assigned to each one. So everybody's part of a, a, a residential house community. Um, and then there's value for the students who um, don't take part, but know these things are going on in the community of which they're affiliated. You know, that there's just this sort of active thing going on in the background and that that's something they're part of, even if, uh, you know, they aren't making it to all of the programs. And um, something I've been struck by this spring is we've had probably, and I, it sounds like this is maybe pretty common. Um, we've had relatively sparse attendance at most of the uh, kind of activities that we've done online but i get lots of emails from students saying thank you so much for all the for keeping this going i really appreciate it and these are ones who we haven't seen all spring um and so th there's some value too i think and this gets in back into the point about communication and sort of what are you going for uh there's some value in in keeping the community rolling over and just communicating the fact to students that even though while they're at home they actually still can be um part of something and actually I'd say for us the one thing the one most successful thing we did was made these little stickers our my our community is called West House and we made little stickers called that say West House at home on them and the students could send us our address and we could mail them a sticker 
And we got hundreds of requests for these stickers, even people who we haven't seen otherwise. But the, the idea being that they, they seem to, you know, still have an attachment to the community, even if they feel like everything else is so overwhelming that they can't necessarily uh, uh, buy, you know, fit it into their schedule. So I hope, I hope we can continue some of that and kind of keep that in mind as the fall goes forward. I, mean, I think that that actually brings us to another question that's that's kind of been on uh, several people's minds, both in terms of the learning community circles as well as residential colleges, which is how um, how are we using this time as an opportunity, or can we use this time as an opportunity to demonstrate the relevance, the importance of these residential, um, you know, integrated residential communities, whether they come in the form of a, a living learning program or they come in the form of a residential college or an overall residential campus to you know, the, the role of, of higher education and, and the state of our undergraduates in, um, in this country. I mean, I think that one of the things that we've been seeing a lot of is the, the fear, the economic, of the economic fallout of COVID-19 on higher ed. And if we don't come back to face-to-face -face classes in the fall, that there's going to be, um, there will be serious financial fallouts and some of us may feel like our jobs are on the line, especially those of us who work at institutions that have, um, you know, only built some of their models of living around a integrated residential um, and academic program. And will those things end up having to be cut, right? So I think that there's a, there's an opportunity for us to both demonstrate the, the importance and significance of our work um, to both our senior leaders as well as to higher ed as a whole. But I think there's also at the same time a fear that some of us have of us needing to scale back to quote unquote bare bones and something like residential education initiatives being the things that are defunded or cut. So I'd like to hear what some of you all are thinking about that. Hi, I'm Melissa Griselfi. I'm the Dean of the First Year Residential Program at Vanderbilt. And um, there's a couple of things we've been thinking about that. First of all, I just think as a general sort of policy stance, we wouldn't see such widespread dissatisfaction with online learning if kids went to, student, to college just for academics. And so I'm also a professor in teaching and learning. So I do like, I, you know, I teach also, and I know it's been a huge thing to put courses online. So the, it's a separate issue, but it is the case that students don't generally come to college just for the classes. And so it's really clear we wouldn't be having students asking for their tuition back. We wouldn't have students deciding not to come to college in the fall if all classes are going to be online if they only came to college for the classes. And so even just as a narrative to offer, you know, when you think about it that way, it's really clear that there's a reason that students come to a program that's not just online. Um, but we've also um, been really keeping careful track of the kinds of programs we're offering and thinking about um, who's showing up and why they're showing up. And so, um, you know, as we all know, that this has had a huge impact, a wildly different impact on students depending on their level of home security. And so some students are fine. They're like posting pictures of their focaccia and like they're like running on their, you know, they're great. And if they are not showing up to our residential colleges program, like fine, that's good. They, they don't need us right now. And I'm so glad that they have their own sources of security. But what we're seeing are students who who do still need that community for a wide variety of reasons. It's a, it's a subset. And so we have smaller percentage of like participation, but it's still people showing up and saying thank you and reaching out. And so um, I do think just tweaking the narrative a little bit in that way, in those two ways to say um, both that students like wouldn't be so unhappy if they were just here for classes and B, who is showing up to our programs, who needs residential colleges, um, and really trying to make a case for that, um, to me anyway, is making it feel like we're really doing a lot of important work, even if sometimes there's only six people on a Zoom call. We fortunately have a, and, and again, we're, we're in a little bit of a unique situation at Watauga Residential College at Appalachian State that, uh, we are our only residential college on campus, but we have an advancement and alumni office that understands what we do. And so as they were soliciting and recruiting students, 
uh, to talk about, uh, you know, how how the students at Appalachian are handling this disjointed time. Uh, one of the the most um, popular responses came from one of our students at uh, in Watauga, who was able to use that as a venue for talking about what we do and why it's important. Others who are using this as an opportunity to talk about with their administration about the value of what we do. Mm -hmm. So hi folks, I'm Karen Inkless from UVA. Um, we are trying to take advantage of the fact that residential colleges are the only um, residence halls on grounds at UVA that has mixed class level enrollment. The other ones are typically all first year, all second year, that kind of thing. And so what we're trying to emphasize is we can build community and offer first year students, uh, um, kind of like I think what Clark was saying, an opportunity to talk to returning students and who they normally would not have met if they were just a regular incoming first year student and explain how that sense of community really adds to and enhances their experience, particularly because we are assuming that however we begin in the fall, they will not be arriving in person. Right. So not only do they not know a lot of, um, of students, period, but they don't get to see them in person except on a screen. So we're trying to take advantage of the fact that we have returning students um, through things like Big Buddies and um, virtual scavenger hunts, things like that that gets them introduced to each other, even if it happens to be remotely at first. So I, I just want to share um, one thing we've talked about doing that's kind of related to the getting to know you within the, like if, if we're all online. Um, there's a really interesting study that was done a couple of years ago um, by a professor who was at Harvard at the time named Hunter Gelbach. And he was looking at the relationship between um, connectedness and academic achievement. And they did this tiny little intervention. So they gave it, this is in high school, they gave a survey to all the high school students and all the teachers that was like, well, what do you like to do? What are your hobbies? What are your preferences? It was very superficial. And um, everybody filled it out. And then they gave teachers um, their student survey results so they could see what kinds of things do they have in common with their students that they might not have otherwise known. And that's it. That was the intervention. And um, test scores went up like a whole standard deviation in the school. And so what they conclude is that connectedness is one of the big factors that influence learning and, and just engagement in general. And so we've been talking about that as a way of thinking about building community from afar, um, especially as we hope like eventually students will be together in a, in a residence and to think about whether or how, we have lots of prohibitions against giving surveys out at Vanderbilt. So this will take 12 levels of like permission, but um, could we give students those kinds of surveys and then help form those kinds of very informal affinity groups that we know can be about topics that cut across all kinds of experiences um, and use that as a community building, sort of a first pass community building measure. Um, and we have a structure here for all first year students. It's called Visions, which is a kind of extended orientation program that um, that structure is already in place. And so we could sort of take advantage of that to also build some of those connections. And I just want to um, kind of dovetail into what Melissa was also talking about is that I think that one of the things that we can do is to make sure that we are um, <clears throat> reaching out to our colleagues that uh, work in distance learning uh, or faculty members that research and know the research about uh, pedagogic pe pedagogical theory for distance learning. And a lot of what uh, the tenets of a residential college is, 
is tied in directly to those types of tenants uh, for distance learning. And so you can easily make that connection for what you're doing. But if you haven't reached out to those people and you don't know what uh, those, those best practices are, then you're going to be less likely to tie what you're doing to those theories. Um, and so using the theories that we all use today about uh, connection and how you connect face to face, um, it is all well and good when we're together. Um, but now that we are not, uh, it's on us if we're going to go to the powers that be and, and really talk ourselves up. We can easily do that because what we are foundationally is really easily tied to some of that, uh, that theory uh, to practice that is out there in distance learning. Connecting into that, um, and I've been having conversations on my campus when we think of um, whether it's how students are experienced in the classroom, um, how they experience a residence hall or the learning community or um, student organizations. Um, I think it would behoove all of us to think about how do we integrate um, virtual into those experiences, know, knowing that there's possibility um, you know, or at least, you know, as we look at um, some areas of the news that there may be different points where there are spikes in COVID and there is a need for us to pull students out of groups um, and to sort of self-isolate again. And if that virtual experience is already embedded in the experience, it's less of a, less of a difficult transition, I think, and maybe feels a little natural for students. Um, and I think Carl's comment as far as in looking at, well, like what are, what are the pedagogical approaches within distance learning and how do you maybe consider some of those pieces um, as you think about the planning for um, the next year? Hello, I'm Jill. Uh, I'm calling from my home office here in St. Louis. I'm at WashU for about three and a half more weeks and on June 1, I'll be joining Vanderbilt University. I think um, one of the things that we need to think about from a residential college standpoint are all the resources that we offer and how do we leverage that to Shannon's point. And I'm part of a research team. Some of my colleagues are on that team, Laura and Jen. And one of the things that we found about uh, students uh, that live in residential colleges, uh, they thrive. And in particular, first generation college students thrive at higher levels. So how are we providing those resources and those, um, how, how, how are we delivering those even in a virtual setting, I think is really critical. And to Melissa's point, I mean, there are students that we need to be delivering these resources to in lots of different ways. So I think that that's part of our mission. And regardless of, I mean, and obviously if we have to del deliver that in a different way, we have to be creative and innovative. And that's our challenge, but I think that that's something that we all have to really be mindful of. So, um, yeah, I just want to mention that. And um, yeah, so how do how do we do that? And I'm curious of how you know what are what are you all thinking about in that way? So um, I have taught a lot of online classes, actually, and what, one of the things that our team has started doing, um, Jill, you'll learn, is that I said, I don't know what the university is doing. I do know that it takes uh, three times longer to develop anything online than it does for a face-to-face -face setting. So, so our team starts next week in operation online um, because uh, we will. Actually, I was just told today in a faculty meeting that Vanderbilt is requiring all faculty to have online components of their class in the fall, regardless of what happens, because we want to make sure that students who can't come to camp, I, I'm not sure if we are coming to campus, but if we do, that students who cannot are still able to access all classes. So um, we have to do it anyway. But what we've started to think about is um, what are the way, so Zoom is a, basically it's a lecture delivery format with a side of small group conversation, right? Which is like very difficult to manage anyway. If you, I don't know if you've ever, how many of you have taught online classes, but the, the, um, the breakout rooms are really difficult to manage actually. Um, and so it's just, it's just best for a lecture. Even this sort of whole class conversation model that we have going here has weird awkwardness because we can't read each other's social cues. And so like understanding what it's good for is useful. 
And then understanding, therefore, what it cannot do is useful. And so we've started to really think about other kinds of tools that we can use to actually support legitimate interaction virtually. And some of them are silly, like a thing like Padlet, which is just basically an online collective sticky note generator. But like, how many times do we use sticky notes in our classes? Actually, all the time is a brainstorming tool, right? So we've started to think about the kinds of um, informal interaction that we build into our activities and, and what is available to support those things. Um, and I think that, so when I'm teaching, because I'm a professor in teaching and learning and I study learning, I do know some things about like instructional design. And so what we talk about is um, the, sort of imagining the ways that we're inviting students to learn. And so if you're only inviting students to learn by listening, you're actually undermining most of the opportunities to learn that are available to people. So if we think about the different ways that people can engage information, they can engage it by talking, they can problem solve, they can apply something new, they can make a representation, they can make a model. There's all these different things that we do to engage information and to sort of imagine that Zoom is just good for presenting information. And I think even just knowing that, and like, it's just like the truth I have to say as a parent, like video games are mostly to entertain, like don't confuse yourself that you're learning, that the kid is learning anything. Like it's liberating, right? So I'm like, okay, this is the entertainment time. Um, and I think understanding that about Zoom as well has been like sort of a first step for our team. So we can really understand what we can do here and what we have to search for to do the other stuff we have in mind. One point related to this, there's a couple of things coming along in the chat about, you know, how do we, how do we, and I've mentioned this, or we heard people mention this a couple of times, how do we convince the powers that be that in the long run, that we need to have, that the residential college model is something that needs to be continually funded. It takes money and it takes resources and everybody's going to be strapped. Um, and uh, I think in some ways, it's important to try to internalize. I mean, Melissa mentioned all the things that we can do to try to take best advantage of, of online learning. But at some level, there's a lot of stuff that is, I mean, you just, I think, in, somebody made this point really early on that the, I think maybe with also Melissa, that that's not why people come to college, right? For the most part, at least when they come to residential colleges, they come to it for the whole experience. And so I would like to, I wonder, and I don't know, I don't know if actually if we are, Mike Wooten might know, but I don't know if we're doing any, anything like this, but um, uh, it would be really useful to have some sense of from a, some kind of a survey instrument or something of what really is lacking, even if we're doing our, our um, online education as well as possible. What are the things that we're still missing out of the residential experience? And then say, okay, we clearly have identified these are the reasons why we need to have an, a residential uh, experience for students. And then come back and say, well, okay, we know based on a lot of the research that you all have done and, and people have done for a long time, that in order to achieve those things, a residential college is the most effective way to do it, if you see what I mean. So in, uh, people have talked about how in some ways this, this uh, particular experiment that we'll doing, we're doing here will prove the value of a residential uh, 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 you know, college education. Um, but it, in that sense, it, when, if you can figure out really what that value is and then say, this is something that we need to continue doing, this is what our sort of special sauce is for, uh, for actual, you know, physical brick and mortar colleges, then you can easily make this next step and say, well, if you're really going to try to be excellent in that, then residential college, actually having a residential college system or some, uh, type of communities like that are excellent. So I, I'm, Anyway, I wonder whether there's an opportunity to sort of leverage that as we're sort of going back into a, a fully, um, as people, I've heard people refer to the 3D world. <laughs> as we're getting back into the 3D world, like, you know, can we really show that, that the way that we are doing things is the way that, that needs to be, uh, you know, funded and prioritized?
I think one thing is like, I think that one, uh, we talked about this a little bit, Lauren Oliver from Virginia Tech, um, I work with our res colleges there. And we talked about this a little bit yesterday is are some of our deepest learning we all know happens in relationship. Um, and a lot of, I don't know if other schools have this kind of barrier, but our IT doesn't really let us use uh, softwares or different or kind of endorse different platforms that might be the most natural way for students to connect virtually where we have to have some kind of security barriers on that. So a lot of students would love something like house party or would love to do different like games together. And that's where some of like the most, uh, I think deepening of relationships could happen when students are finding that they're a little strained on Zoom um, and platforms that are traditionally used through the university mechanism. Um, so I think that that's one thing of how do we figure out during this time to maybe be less rigid in places that normally we kind of try to be like rigid. Are there ways in which we can be less so to let natural and organic like relationship building happen across students that we can also like learn from because I think that it doesn't help us either to have students in those platforms doing that relationship building and then not to have knowledge or participation or engagement from faculty or other campus partners that could be like really helpful during that time to be using those platforms too. Um, so that's one thing that I've like thought about in terms of how we think more creatively about opening ourselves up to different like online platforms. Um, and another thing that I've thought about too is um, I don't know if anybody has participated in online classes. Uh, we did a little bit in high school, but flipped classes where you watch the materials before and maybe someone said this guy, I know I jumped on a little bit late, but where you watch the material before coming into the conversation um, and then kind of share out, out after. Um, and I've thought a lot with that, if we use that mechanism for some of our weekly teas and stuff, how to maybe set students up with faculty members in pods um, so that they have a consistent network in which they're deepening relationships because I think it's going to be unrealistic to expect them all to connect across the whole sphere of the student body. So that those are kind of the things that I've been thinking on and how we we touch on some of these um, core challenges. I suppose I might add to that, and thank you, Lauren and uh, Michael and, and Paula for prompting this part of the discussion. Um, you know, one of the things that residential colleges obviously bring to uh, a student's university experience, at least in America, is the, is the partnership. When it works well, it works incomparably well between uh, academic affairs, faculty, and student affairs and housing. Um, and so I think one of the ways to sort of uh, address some of these things, I like how Paula put it, instead of protecting traditional practices, expanding them to new spaces, is to sort of ask ourselves how we do that in a virtual world if we're required to, right? How we, how we show and, and exemplify uh, and, and enact that partnership between faculty uh, and student affairs. Um, and I think there are ways to do that. I, I appreciate you all sort of putting that in the forefront of my mind and think about how, as we move forward, how we'll do that with our colleagues in housing and student affairs. While we're on that subject, uh, I'll just point at the question that just popped up on there uh, on the chat box, but how we do some of these things to reach out to first generation low income students to ensure that they're getting connected to resources. Any ideas there? I know at Dartmouth, one thing we did here, um, I imagine a number of uh, places may still have some students on campus um, for various reasons. Um, we have a big international student population, so a lot of the ones that we have are the ones who couldn't go home um, for, for various reasons, but we also have students who their family situation or whatever, it was not, not safe for them to be at home, so they had to be here. And uh, um, I just um, heard yesterday, actually, that there's been a um, 
organized effort by uh, the student affairs staff who are the people who work in our residential um, uh, house system to actually reach out individually to each of the students who are on campus here just to check in and see how they're doing. Because it is really a weird experience. They're all walking around. They, they have to socially distance, but they see each other. But the place is kind of a ghost town. And um, it's, it's challenging. Um, uh, and I, from what I understand, uh, that was very well received that the students for the most part really appreciated being reached out to. But you know, that's a small subset. Um, and uh, I think if, when you know where someone is and you kind of have a re specific reason for contacting them, that's easier. If you're trying to identify all the students who may have trouble engaging, um, that's harder. I know that Dartmouth at least has, there are, are student affairs and our academic deans. Um, I'm a faculty member as the head of the house, and so I haven't done this stuff uh, specifically, but I know that, that our, um, uh, our staff have been just unbelievable in the amount of work that they've been doing, both helping students transition back home and also uh, trying to, to keep tabs on, on people. But it is a, a challenging question um, for how to do that, all, all that stuff remotely. Um, and so, yeah. I don't have a really good answer other than I think if you can make those connections, they are appreciated. One thing I can suggest is at least at UVA and maybe at other universities, the university does know who is first generation. Uh, they don't, they're not very good at releasing income information for obvious privacy reasons, but they do know who is a first generation student. Uh, I've often asked our institutional research office amongst my students, which ones are ones who are first gen and they have told me. So I can identify them. Now we don't use that information and say, hey, we found out you're a first gen student. That's not a very responsible way to use that data. But we have reached out in different ways uh, to that population to, make, to ask questions like, do you need help in moving? Um, can we provide you uh, basic supplies when you first get to grounds, things like that. At Elon, we took a similar approach when all of this happened. We actually haven't closed yet. We did not require students to go home because we knew that students, for whatever reasons, may not have been able to go home. So if a student needed to stay, they, they stay, no questions asked. Now that did present some challenges when we got to credits and refunds, but I think the university took the approach that we were putting students first in that. And so I'm, I'm proud that we did that. Yeah, we're still, we sell about 30 students. We're feeding them because now the dining hall is closed. So we are actually the ones that are feeding them as well as housing them. I will say to you at, at Elon, we have an established office, a center for access and success that had already, already had um, structures in place for reaching out. And so if I were thinking about how you could quickly replicate some of the structures that are working, um, one is having a dedicated point person that those students know they could contact and that is contacting those students. And so that could be anybody on any team. We just happen to have somebody who's a director of that program and the students already have a relationship with. I've been asking, um, I work fairly closely with that program. So I have a couple of students in my, in my actual classes who are connected with that program. So I purposely have asked them, so how is, how is this program, um, are, are, are there things that this program is doing um, that um, that might be, you know, just kind of an idea of are those students being reached? And they did have conversations about making sure the students had technology access for everything from computers to Wi-Fi and things like that, and and helped. And, and those, so the students knew that, knew that they could go to that point person and ask for that because they already that person already kind of knew their story and their background, so it wasn't the cold calling like we think you might need some help. Um, the other thing that that, that, that um, program has is they have a really, really strong network of mentors, so upper level students who have come through that program and who are fairly more on their feet that are checking in with mentees. So they're kind of, they, they have this mentoring program. So if there's a way to connect student to student in that pipeline, um, that might be a way to do it. But I think having the point person so that somebody knows they can trust has been a way that that our first gen students have been reached out to if they're off campus. I think that's a, a really great point, Paula, that you brought up. Um, to kind of tie this back to a conversation earlier, one of the pieces of a residential college that makes a residential college so successful is the intertwining of so many aspects of the university. And so we are really good at 
knowing lots of people and having connections to lots of people. And so I think it would behoove us to use those connections and make sure that we know what is happening out there because there are other departments out there that are serving um, these traditionally underserved communities and we should go out and say, what are you doing? And it doesn't always mean that we have to replicate it, but if we can partner with them or if we know that that's happening and we can give them some support in, in whatever manner, um, then it can show how we uh, are one of those linchpin pieces of an institution where we are tying together um, all of these different support mechanisms for our students. And so uh, I just, I, I think that one of the things that we're doing uh, at Purdue um, is we, we were, we had already unveiled an initiative uh, that was this kind of, um, this kind of aspirational overarching uh, program called Steps to Leaps that has five tenants and, and kind of get us all on the same language. And we had been doing it in person throughout the year. And then when all of this hit, we started doing these lunch and learns virtually. And uh, it, it kind of exploded. We went from having about 30 people attend to having 60 to 100 attend. And a lot of what we were doing is just sharing information about here are here's a, a, a department that's doing this and here's how you can take that information and use it in what you're doing. And so I just think there, there's so much out there and available on every campus. I think what we need to be cognizant of though, like to kind of follow up on that point, I think what I worry about is kind of like the Netflix paralysis of sorts. I often use this as like a way to talk about things when students are so overwhelmed by so many options. What ends up happening is that especially first gen and low income students can't sift through those options. So it's difficult for them to understand like what resource or mechanism to go through in order to get connected to that. And I think it's going to be ever more important for res colleges to be like a general starting point for students, like you're saying, Carl, in terms of resource connection, um, that they're reminded that there's like one or two people that they can start there and that the path to connection can be simple. Um, I think that in a kind of this, I'm sure many institutions um, are talking about furloughs. And I think that there are offices fighting to stay relevant right now. And in that fighting to kind of stay relevant, we're seeing messages, messaging to students um, continue to just grow. Because um, I think everybody wants to be a support for our students in terms of different vision of student affairs offices and faculty, et cetera. But I think what I worry about is that students are getting so tapped that they can't sift through that. And I think we need to figure out how we can message less, actually less to students and more strategically mm -hmm. so that the path to resources and the path to engagement seems uh, simple. I think if it's not clear, we'll lose students who can't sift through that information and distract them from what their most important thing is in college, which is being connected to their academics. Well, I think that that's primary purpose, some people might argue. So we have a question from uh, Brittany in the in the chat about how supervisory models of undergrad leaders like RAs and other peer mentors might shift or change, particularly in um, how we build relationships with first year students who are transitioning into college in a, a hybrid or possibly all virtual world. And I think that I just want to extend that question to incorporate something else that's that's been a bit of a concern, I think, for a lot of people right now is burnout for many of us who are trying to, uh, and just, you know, Zoom fatigue, right, for many of us who are trying to offer this kind of support to our students and all of us having to, you know, maintain in our the hope that we will one day return to pre-pandemic times and and also the the other hope that um you know there will be some kind of some kind of end in sight and we will we will be able to know when that end is is coming and with that kind of level of you know constantly carrying the indefinite with the need to support both our students but also take care of ourselves I think a lot of people are talking about how I can't do one more Zoom, I can't do one more email, I can't do one more whatever it is, reach out to students. And so I, I think we also need to be cognizant of the fact that when we think about different staff models, whether it's for our faculty and staff who are doing this work or even our student leaders, that we have to be mindful of the, the kind of unique 
exhaustion that comes with um, these virtual realities that we're in now and trying to maintain these relationships in a, whether it's a hybrid or a fully virtual um, connection to our students. So I just wanna throw that out there as another concern for, for people to consider and, and talk about. I would say just to add to that, that as with all of our work, you know, empathy and understanding the sort of d emotional and and uh, intellectual and social um, experiences of our students are so important. And this is one case where we're kind of all experiencing this all at the same time, right? Like n none of us have had, I, I hope that none of us have had to spend so much time on video chat during the whole day. And so we're all feeling this, this new uh, experience of Zoom burnout all at once. Um, and so that, that certainly in, in terms of um, our thinking and, and discussions that, that we've had in our community, we've really tried to try to map that onto what the students are feeling like, what can we do? Well, would you want to you know, do this particular thing in the evening or what can we expect to be a, a, a reasonable engagement? Um, and I, I think that's all really something we, uh, I think that can help in terms of understanding what the students are going through is that to a large extent, all of us are, are going through the same thing. Um, and uh, to, just to keep that in mind. This may not be a possibility for everybody, but, uh, and not all of our student leaders take advantage of this, but our student leaders can receive academic credit for the work that they're doing with uh, with other students. Uh, and that's kind of, the, it, it is an elective, so it does, you know, it doesn't count toward a degree plan, but it is an option that a lot of our students seem to find really valuable. The other thing that we do with our student leaders, whether they're RAs or uh, assume other roles in the college is, uh, we help them understand how they can use those leadership roles, those leadership positions uh, as, uh, as a way to, uh, to develop their own resumes, their own skill set, uh, and can market that as they move on. And we're very intentional kind of in working with our Career Development Center with other faculty, with our student affairs partners uh, in how they can do that kind of thing. Well, I wanna be mindful of the time. I know that uh, about half of the people that we started with have already signed off. So it looks like maybe five o'clock is the time for a little bit after five is the time for us to bring this to a close. But uh, we value hearing all, from all of your perspectives and your experiences, and we'd like to keep this conversation going. So I think you can probably plan to hear from us a little bit later this summer, once some of us have some more concrete uh, plans or ideas about what's gonna be expected of us and how we're gonna engage with our students in the fall semester. Um, so I look forward to another conversation with all of you and sharing both our resources, our ideas, and our expertise. Thank you all for being on the call. Thank you. Shannon, I'll um, copy the link and share it with the executive team and then we can distribute however we see fit. Sounds great. Thank you for letting us use your Zoom. <laughs> sure, glad to. And Clark, I just shared those minutes with you. Um, okay. If you got that. Okay, and I'll share them with uh, Trish uh, and the rest of the executive team so that they can uh, use them. Okay. Okay, sounds good. All right. We'll see y'all. Bye.